but we want to fine tune them to the latest requirements in industry if we covid ok vannappo nammal pudhiye pudhiye benchmarks gal kandupidikkana joligalkum training inum learning system inum ella appo adilikkulla nalla oru development aayirikkum nalla oru creative development aayirikkum ittaram series unde nammal uddheshikkunathu so formally i invite uh, the principal of the college and dr vijay kumar who is a former director of technical education we also have today with us one of the uh, prominent uh, alumni in the news recently dr venkata krishnan uh, he is with uh, isro and he is a senior most uh, one of the senior most officers in isro promoted recently then we also have with, with us i think uh, sharat chandra das who was a lecturer when we we all studied uh, in engineering college in those times in the early uh, early 80s or late 70s so i invite uh, dr paul to start his session so he'll introduce how he is going to conduct the session Dr. Paul. Thank you, thank you, Professor uh, Wall. You know, Professor Krishna. Uh, you know, so uh, so what what I'm going to do is uh, try and present uh, uh, you know uh, some information that hopefully is helpful for the next generation. And the topic is education and and job security in the age of uh, cognitive machines. So I'll explain each of them and define them so that we get the context. correct and and context is very very important and uh, you know what strikes me is that recently last week we had a zoom call with uh, some of our old uh, friends and then uh, you know some somebody is seeing me after 30 years and so he said uh, you know uh, what is your background and i started explaining uh, my engineering and all the stuff which i'm going to talk about very soon and then i after i finished he was very courteous and he kept waiting and then he said no 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 i meant what is your zoom background i had a beach in the back of me uh, and so so context is very very important in education and so i need to keep the context correct uh, because otherwise certain terms that we use might be misinterpreted so so i'm going to first define education and then uh, then we'll go to each of those uh, different terms okay so uh, we're going to take two breaks in between so that i don't lecture continuously and before i do that again context uh, here is my first slide and this is the attention span or the brain activity of a student uh, can you see my mouse move can you see my mouse a thumbs up okay okay so this is the brain activity of an mit student uh, for the whole week so this is the time on the x axis and the number of days on the y axis and i want to just focus your attention on class where whichever yellow blocks are drawn you can see that the brain activity is pretty much dead when the student is sitting in class and that's just like tv so if you look at tv again the brain activity is dead so that's because your brain is really not working you're just uh, kind of uh, looking at something and just you know it just passes through your neurons in a sense and so it, it is known from learning theory and uh, i'll tell you at the end why we have actually changed it that way we do not lecture for 15 minutes anymore because if you lecture for a long time we definitely know that the student average student is going to be listening to something else or dreaming about something else and so because of this this is the the scientific reason why uh, i'll tell you what the outline of the lecture is and we're going to do it in three blocks so the first block i'll define education so that we get the context correct and then uh, i will show you how i went through my career so as a template so that you can then decide uh, how to compare yourself and then i'll show you a bunch of projects the intent is not to describe the projects normally each project is a lecture by itself but to show you the width of what could be done if you graduate from gct the second block and then we'll take a break there after the projects and the second block is about how intelligence evolved in human society and then uh, you know how should we learn in the age of cognitive machines and what the jobs in the future so that's the second block then we'll take another break for 10 minutes and so we'll open it up for q and a the whole idea is that when we break it hopefully you will ask questions and then it will become more like a discussion rather than a lecture you know i have people from whom i have learned in this 
in this audience, so I do not pretend to be teaching anybody. Um, and so, uh, but I think a discussion is a good thing as a part of education. And finally, we'll conclude with what are the education models out there, and then we'll conclude the lecture. So that is the entire presentation uh, scheme we're going to go through. So let me start with education. So I'm going to define education so that uh, we are all on the same page. Part of it is, uh, is a standard definition, and part of it is I've added on to it so that you kind of understand where I'm going with this. So the first part of education is that it is a process. And so we need to know that it's a continuous kind of thing. And what we do is we absorb concepts and skills. So for example, we learn new things in engineering and we might master some skills in engineering like machining or programming or whatever that be. Uh, I believe this is a mainly computer science kind of group, right? So, uh, but then along with that, values and beliefs and habits that you get is also part of education. And that is why uh, an online system alone might, might be able to give you content uh, and uh, concepts but they might not be able to instill values and beliefs in it. And so I, I believe that Pritchard Engineering College has actually instilled in me certain sets of values, which I believe has done good for me. And so along the path, you will pick up degrees and certificates. And so the word path is kind of uh, important and I'll come, come back to that uh, later in, in the process of how we learn. And the whole intent is to produce new knowledge. So we have got knowledge from our forefathers. They have taught us some stuff, knowledge is there. And then our goal is to create new knowledge and hand it over to the next generation. And if we don't do that, then the purpose of education is not really met. And so this is the context in which I'm going to be uh, talking about. Now, before we get there, I want to kind of throw a curve here, which uh, I found very interesting. And I think it's, it's important for everybody to know. Charles Darwin uh, said that ignorance more frequently begets confidence than knowledge. And, uh, you know, there was a research later on done by Dunning and Kruger. And so this is the curve. So on the x-axis, you have knowledge and experience. And when you know nothing, you're somewhere here. And when you are an expert, you're somewhere there. Okay. And on the y-axis, you have confidence. And so typically, uh, you go up. And then when you know nothing is when you think that you know a lot. And then suddenly the whole thing collapses. And the best way to kind of remember this uh, is, is what I normally tell my students. When you finish your bachelor's degree, that is when you think you know everything because you do not know the entire thing. And then when you start doing your master's is when you come down that slope and then you realize that you know nothing. And then when you get to the PhD uh, level is when you realize that nobody knows nothing, including your own advisor. And that is when the advisor will actually give you a PhD and send you off. And then, uh, you know, this doesn't have to be with, you, you don't necessarily have to go through this path, but this is in general. The more you know, the, the less confident you get. And then there comes a stage where you become very curious and you start learning. And hopefully, I hope all of you who are young will, will have that curiosity and then you will start self-learning. And when you start self-learning, your confidence will start going up and then hopefully most of us will get into a state of enlightenment, okay? And some of us, you know, may, maybe, you know, they will reach a, a higher level, but at least the goal is to come to that black dot. So that is the context. Again, uh, setting up the context so that we are all uh, on the same page. So the next thing I'm going to talk about is uh, my particular path uh, was a state. And so those of you who have learned uh, thermodynamics and then you will understand what I am saying. Uh, that is, uh, the path and the state are important. And so there are state functions and path functions. But uh, this is a reflection uh, based on my path. Uh, so you have, uh, you know, in the context of education and career. So I started, uh, you know, with DCT, uh, you know, uh, started off there well, went to IIT, did a master's in PhD in ocean wave energy. And then uh, my PhD work then later on became part of the design for uh, a device that we built in Virginia, Kerala. Uh, most of you would, might not have known such a thing existed. It was there in the papers for some time. Uh, but then I then came to the US on a US Fulbright. And then uh, I came back from the US and joined the IIT Madras faculty in ocean engineering. Then, uh, you know, had some change in mind, uh, went to Germany for an Alexander von Humboldt fellowship. And then Texas A&M, where I am right now, they gave me a full scholarship to do an MBA. I don't know why, but they gave me, and so I decided to do the MBA. And then I joined a company called Knowledge Based Systems, which is an AI artificial intelligence research company, uh, helping them uh, do defense contracts, basically. 
And then uh, 2016 is when Texas A&M called me and said, hey, can you come and teach? Uh, and so I, I joined the faculty here in the ocean engineering department again. So that is my background. And so my next step is to kind of introduce you to some projects that I have done. The intent here is to show you the breadth of things that you can do if you graduate from GCT. Okay, so that's very important. So the first one I'll tell you is this wave energy thing, which you saw the picture earlier. And the whole intent, this is one module that we built. It was 150 kilowatts. We pumped electricity to the, to the Kerala State uh, Electricity Grid. Uh, and so the intent was to build a wall in the sea. And people were normally dumping stones in the sea. And we said, hey, there is a better way to do that. If we build it out of concrete, then we can build a wall like this. So this is an artist's rendition of that stuff. And this is one module. So this is a design that I did. Uh, based off the prototype design here, and the Japanese actually funded me to go and present this work a long time back in the 1990s. And so this is energy absorbing wall multifunctional concept. People are still working on this, and US is now getting into wave energy, and there seems to be some activity going on here. So that is just the general gist of that project. The next one I want to tell you is more uh, to look at technology from a different perspective, from a business perspective. So there was this company called Liquid Robotics. It still exists. Uh, and they had what is known as a wave glider. And so you have a float on the top with a glider at the bottom, and you can see the photograph on the right here. And so this is the glider, and this is the, uh, the bottom, uh, so the bottom glider here, and there's a diver here uh, next to this to kind of give you a perspective of how big it is. Now, this broke the world uh, Guinness records uh, of uh, renewable energy propulsion. From the US, it went to Australia and Japan. Now, this company actually hired James Goosling. For those of you computer scientists will know that he was the inventor of Java. And so they didn't actually want to sell the device. They wanted to sell the data that comes out of the device in a knowledge form at a highly curated form. And so they were making a lot of money selling the data rather than sell the platform. So uh, you can see the business model here implemented. So collection of data in the ocean is very difficult. They use a robotic vehicle, collect data, and sell the knowledge that is the data collected from the ocean. Boeing bought them just uh, two, three years back. So they made a good killing on that uh, you know, pro project. So think, think always at a very large scale. And I'll, I'll talk about systems level thinking very soon. Here's another project I worked on called the Aging Aircraft pro uh, Project. Uh, so what happened is that a uh, long time back, you know, one of the aircraft, uh, you know, most aircraft are designed for 25 years. And when the life of the aircraft exceeds, they change the engine and all that. And you know, typically, folks forgot to forgot about corrosion. This is aluminium, so it's not it doesn't corrode very easily. Uh, but the riveted joint, uh, uh, you know, kind of gave way. And one of the aerostats actually, she was uh, she died because she flew away because she was not with the seatbelt. Most of them landed safely, and and this triggered a huge research program. And I was actually doing the image processing for computing the amount of corrosion that is required. So we built the tool. Uh, a software tool to kind of do that. So these are the kind of cool things that you can do if you learn your stuff and with you know. So um, so the next one, uh, which is very interesting, is uh, called Trace Logic. And so this is an aircraft carrier for the US Navy. Uh, we have about 60 aircraft on top of them. And uh, 2015 was when we were able to actually take off and land the first autonomous fighter aircraft on board a carrier. So once they land, uh, you know, there's, it's a very crowded place. It's a small area. It's a huge ship, but you know, 60 aircraft on top is very difficult. So one of the questions that came is, hey, we can fly autonomously an aircraft, we can land it, but we cannot park it. So, so the question is, can we figure out an autonomous way to do it? And I obviously always say yes. And so I said, give me the data of the traffic. And then we took the traffic data and what you see is traffic pattern here. And the thickness of the line kind of tells you the, uh, the statistics of how many times that path was used. And you can see that there is a kind of standardized path here. And so the way I explain this to the Navy is that imagine an alien coming down from space. They have nothing, don't, no idea about our traffic. Can they discover what the rules of traffic are? And I said, yes. All you do is you sit at a traffic light, look at it, and then you see that, hey, everybody is stopping when the light is red. Everybody is going when the light is green. And if you statistically do that enough, then you can say that red means stop and uh, green means go. But once in a while, an idiot will jump a stoplight. And then you will say that that is a statistical anomaly. That is a violation of a rule. So you extend that principle 
to something as complex as this, then you can use deep learning and stuff like that to kind of figure out what the rules are. And so this project was called Trace Logic. And so I'm a mechanical engineer, and still we were able to do this because if you understand your concepts well, you can translate what you know into anything you like. Here's another one, and this is called IC, which means that I can see, uh, but the Navy asked, can you read the brain of a soldier? And um, you know, I, I you know, got together with some psychology folks, and then they said in limited context, it's called a forced choice task. So what we used is an eye tracker. And then we, when they look at the screen, if you look at the screen and if you're given a very short duration to look at it, your eye will go to the object on the screen that is most relevant to you in the context. And so what we actually did is actually look at the gaze point, even the pupil size, you can actually track. And what we did is actually uh, track uh, the gaze point. And so we can actually track the gaze point of a soldier and then do other applications with it. So I leave that for now. So IC stands for intuition, which is uh, what the intuition of the human is, and C stands for computation. And so this is a good acronym that kind of sold and I got funded by the Navy. The last one I think I'll show you is actually a missile defense. Uh, again, systems view, very large picture view. There's an initial segment called the boost segment, and this is where you are, the enemy is firing at you. Eventually that will come up to the top of the, of the zenith of it, and that is here. And this is called a mid-course segment. If you cannot shoot it down here or here in the boost segment, then you have to kill it in the terminal segment, which is almost sitting on top of your head. You, know, you need to know that it's a nuclear warhead, so you have to be careful. You are given all these assets that are space tracking sensors and bottom, you know, ocean going, expand radars. So what we did is that we were trying to differentiate uh, between what's called as decoys and, and warheads, meaning that when you send up a, a, a warhead, they normally split it into 10 or so uh, stuff and only one of them will be a nuclear warhead and so our goal was to find out which one of the 10 that they split up is the nuclear warhead using uh, you know a technology that the sensor technology so i'll leave it at that uh, so the goal here was like not to teach you about any of these things but to give you a breadth of what we can do uh, with the kind of projects uh, that that i've shown you so i'll end with this slide i think uh, so the important thing here is that you have to be very curious and you have to be in perpetual learning mode. That's the only way to kind of stay on the top of the game. And then you have to be flexible and adaptable. Otherwise, you know, you will not be able to do different things. And systems thinking is what I talked to you about earlier. Like you have to see the big picture and most of us will be doing a small part of a big thing. And so, you know, you don't, nobody can do everything at the same time. That's why team in engineering team is a, is a very, very important word. And you can ask, uh, other folks who have done large-scale systems without a team nothing works you should also be aware of your short term versus your long term uh, you know you should be aware of that and so short term is is what are you doing right now and long term is you should have a general liking towards something and that is what drives what are the kinds of projects that you will actually choose to do in your life and so we are scientists and engineers and uh, and our job is to problem solve and so here is something that uh, I look at the way I learn. Uh, so I call them patterns. So whatever we learn is a pattern of knowledge. And our goal is to adapt and improve what we have been taught so that we can actually solve problems that has not been solved before. And so that brings us uh, to what is called as mental models. So mental model, is what, is the, uh, what is the way the knowledge is kept inside your brain? So when I tell you about Newton's law, what is inside each and every one of your brain and what is inside my brain will all be different. And that is because we have taken different paths. So that is why this path is important because we have all been access to different kinds of knowledge. And so in computer science, you will hear them as knowledge graphs. You can go research that and you will see that that is the mathematical or the computer science representation of what we think is the different groups of knowledge and how we can store them together. It is very important that you have a very robust and diverse knowledge base, then you can learn new things faster. And then the rate at which you learn will increase when you know a lot more things. So I, I, want, to, I want to confess here that when I was young, I hated biology um, and, and other things that is non-engineering, uh, you know, for whatever reason this, of this compartmentalization of medicine and engineering. It's a very bad way to learn if you do that. And so please don't restrict yourself. Please try and read something that is outside your comfort zone and I'm a big fan of biology now because I'm looking at bioengineering uh, kind of uh, projects where biology can do self-reproduction, 
and engineering can do scaffolding so that way you can actually have the best of both worlds that is you want an efficient system and also you want a growing system so uh, so that is uh, my first section uh, hopefully that is about 20 minutes now or so uh, i'll open it up for questions and so the moderator please uh, if you have yeah, any dr questions. paul uh, dr paul i got uh, another uh, another thing to do in the mm -hmm. beginning uh, the attendance was uh, somewhat very less but now yeah. it has reached about 143 okay. so I, I i now invite uh, principal dr sheba to uh, formally inaugurate this and uh, speak a few words sorry teacher uh, when I, when we started the attendance was very low we had a booking uh, list of about 180 at the beginning it was uh, attendance was only about 37 so that's why it was shifted to this this time so i invite uh, dr sheba uh, thank you krishna sir faculty and students good evening all uh, at the outset, I would like to thank our uh, GC Alumni Association, especially uh, Professor Krishnamar, uh, then uh, GC Development Trust and uh, Entrepreneurship Development of our college for organizing this program. We know this COVID-19 pandemic has changed our education sector and it has become a catalyst for educational institutions to search for innovative solutions uh, in a very short time. So we have utilized this crisis as an opportunity by organizing this online lecture series. And uh, first lecture already started uh, by Dr. Paul Kola. And uh, it was very interesting. He had started from and I hope that will be to you. And if I organize this as a traditional classroom uh, lecture, uh, I feel that we could not enjoy this and faculty uh, all over the world. So I hope this uh, lecture series we will be continuing to and the students also, and this is also. Uh, Access to this program. I have this program inaugurated. Thank you. Sir, uh, please continue. Okay, uh, Dr. Paul, the yes. questions are, are yet to come. Okay. I think uh, nobody has uh, started having any doubts or questions. Okay. So I think, uh, can I continue with the next session? Yeah, I will, I will go on to the next session. But uh, here, here is the thing, you know, don't be shy. Uh, there is no right or wrong question. So uh, if you do not ask questions, then the uh, usefulness of the whole system is not there. The reason why I broke the lecture is because if I, I, can, I can lecture for hours together and you can ask uh, Krishnamar sir whether I can do it or not. So I don't have any <laughs> problem with yeah, that. Yeah, I know but that, I know that. Really Good? I know that. Like yeah. how, how long you can speak in a stretch? So wonderful. I'm saying I'm intentionally, uh, you know, taking efforts to break the lecture into small segments to give you an opportunity to ask questions. So anyway, let me let me continue to the next section. Uh, you yeah. know, it, it, maybe a lot of you didn't hear the first portion, uh, but we have to start on time. So that's another lesson. You know, time doesn't wait for man. So I think Doctor Doctor right? Paul, there's a question. I think there's a question, <laughs> Doctor Paul. Okay. Yeah, that question is, I think, from uh, Professor Manoj Kumar. Okay. The question is, uh, if education is defined as a path to learning, how does one know what is the best possible path? Okay, good, good question. You know, so uh, there is no good path. Everybody, all of us are individuals that take different paths. I can bet you that no two of us have had the same path up to now, right? We are not going to have it. Everybody has a unique path, but every time, uh, every time we have, um, uh, you know, a decision to make, we make a decision, and that decision then affects where we get. It doesn't matter what decision we take. All that matters is that once we take the decision, we actually try to execute that well. So I'll give you my own example. Uh, you know, when I finished engineering, uh, I had a job with ISRO. I didn't take that ISRO job. 
and I went to IIT. Now that is the choice I made, uh, and you know, and and every choice we make. So you know, there is Dr. Venkatakrishnan here. You know, he made the choice to go to ISRO, and there he sits at the top of the thing, right? So all of us make our own choices. There is no right or wrong here, and and the right thing is that all of us should try different paths that are conducive to our thinking. And then when you do that, then we all achieve unique things. Now, if you look at the big picture of the whole of human society. Uh, if you look at that, our goal is to contribute into that society. Each of us individually means nothing, because if you look at the entire span uh, of the human civilization, we have nothing. We're just a speck of a dot. And so we do what we can best to contribute. And then you hand it over to the next generation and move on. At some point, we all have to leave. So that is how I look at life now. So education in that context is that you do what is interesting to you. Then you will all do very good things. Now, here is another thing I want to say in that context is that I've had a lot of parents call me and say, hey, tell me what is the most paying job in the US? So I want my kids to do that. That is a very, very bad way of trying to push your kids, because once you're dead and gone, then those poor kids will have to deal with living in uh, or trying to do a job that they don't like to do because their parents wanted to do it. So please allow your kids to do whatever they like. The world is so big right now. There's opportunity in every stream. So path. You should, everybody should choose their path. And one more thing I want to say about the path is that you don't always have to be right. You know, I might take a fork decision, I might turn to left, and then I might realize that that is not where I want to be. And then I might come back or turn around or do things. So I went from academia to the industry and I came back to academia because it, it looks like I have a gift for teaching. So I just came back. Uh, but we can make mistakes along the path. And that is what is very human about this whole thing. And it's very interesting that way. So don't don't beat up too much on the path that you've taken, but but strive towards getting to your long term goal. And so, you know, you will error correct. You will error correct and eventually reach where you want to if you if you have the drive and the and the resources to do that. Right. So you have to go search for it and get that. That was a long answer, though. Yeah, Paul, I, I got it. one more question. From Geeta Menon, she's her batchmate. Yeah, Geeta. Hey, yeah. Geeta is. I think she's in, she's UK. in the UK, right? So, Paul, how important do you think it's to keep an open mind and get maximum exposure to aid one's thinking and be innovative? Very good, very good, Geeta. Yeah. So that is exactly. I think I kind of. <laughs> Rephrase it in a sense, you know, be be very, very open, be very open. And I told you my own example. I hated biology. Now I have actually taken courses in biology online uh, from MIT. And so, you know, even at this age, I kind of get very curious and then learn. So keeping an open mind is very, very important. And, and what is I don't know how to stress the importance of this, but generally most of the things in the domains have already been mostly solved. And so most of the new activity that happens is at the boundary of two different domains. And so when I showed you that I see project, I never in my wildest dream thought I will read psychology. I had to read psychology, you know human factors before that I see project could be executed. And you have to make it believe so that somebody will fund that research. And so the Navy basically, I was the principal investigator on a psychology based human factor project. And I don't have any background or degree in that. It's just that because I read and I go uh, do enough of background work to be able to write about it and, and, and convince somebody about it. So, yes, very, very important. Keep an open mind. Uh, you know, uh, go to the you don't even have to go to the library now. You know, you can actually do a lot of stuff online. We had to walk up to a library to pick up papers. You don't have to do that. And so you have no excuse uh, from saying there's a lot of online free stuff, MOOCs. I'll talk about that later. So make use of it. If, if you really want to kind of have a good, you know, fruitful uh, career. Yeah, I think, Paul, there is, I think uh, we'll have one more question in the session. A few okay. more are coming, but I think I'll uh, have one more, one more question. And the rest of the questions we'll ask uh, after the next, uh, next block. So okay. this question is from Mohammed Hadi. I think he's a student now in the college. The question is, after graduation, after UG, you have been blessed with being able to be part of many projects and also have an economic support to do the same. That's your case. How long would you think we would have to achieve 
if we stop at the btec degree how, so, how long we would have achieved if we stopped at the btec degree and then just didn't learn anything that's what i i think he he means okay so i i've kind of alluded to this so those if you've seen my uh, you know dunning kruger curve i i kind of said that masters bachelor's masters and phd but it doesn't really matter i can show you uh, million <laughs> i can't say millions but i can show you plenty of people who have a bachelor's degree who have much more capability than i had, i do so the phd means nothing the phd means nothing i'm telling you it, it's sad to tell that into an educational system but the phd is valuable depending on how you look at it right so it is not about the phd what matters is what you know and i'll come to that later i'll come to grades versus knowledge very soon so let me let me parse that question a little bit more so it is not the number of degrees you have that matter it is the amount of knowledge that you have that matters so i'll give you an example uh, that we are dealing with here elon musk is a guy who started uh, tesla the car company he started spacex and he has got a lot of other things in his thing i don't think he has a phd uh, i'm pretty sure he doesn't have a phd what i'm trying to tell you is that phd's bill gates does not even have a degree i mean he dropped out of harvard and so it is not the degree the formal certified degree that matters it's the knowledge that matters and nobody can stop you from learning in our age we had to go to a library so there was a cost of uh, you know going to the library now that you have online connectivity you can learn almost anything online now there is an issue with fake stuff and we'll come to that a little later but you have to know how to curate information and search and apply them so it is not about degrees and it is not about money because you can always get scholarship i want to tell you this very proudly that trichur engineering college was almost free education for us in our when we were studying it was like very little fees so it was almost like free um iit i had uh, i was the first batch of gate so it was free they paid for it phd they paid for it my mba is paid for i have not paid for my education so if you are very very strong then you can actually get through without paying for anything people will pay you money to learn because they will they have so the way you should look at it is that people need work done and if you can show that you are capable of helping them do that they will pay you a small amount and they will reap a larger reward but that's okay because then you get the education and the degree that you need i think i'll stop there I will keep. I'll keep rambling there. Yeah, I think uh, we'll proceed with the next uh, presentation. Uh, we'll just okay. uh, keep those questions uh, in abeyance for the time being. I got a few more, but let us wait and see how it proceeds. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay, Paul. So, thank you. So let me start to the next session. So. Um, and the next one is i want to kind of walk you through the history of mankind and how how we've been learning and stuff like that and so the evolution of intelligence is the second uh, bunch of uh, stuff that we're going to look and here's a graphic i put together it's a very uh, you know it's a way of trying to put uh, humanity in one shot so this is the top left here what you see is our forefathers they were a nomadic tribe hunting going around and so the knowledge they were accumulating is how to hunt how to survive how not to be eaten by a lion kind of stuff then comes here strictopuram you know you can see that uh, you know lakhs of people can all uh, accumulate together in a, in a in a very close space imagine this you cannot put a bunch of animals there it will not work so humans have got a capability of interconnectedness that is very unique and so we've learned to communicate to each other and so we can actually control large masses now down here is a picture from vatican uh this is the uh, 2013 or so everybody with smartphones they they're gathering in huge groups but now here's the different change so there is a phase change in civilization where all the data that is acquired by this uh, you know sensors you could think of it which people are interacting with so there is a human machine interaction is then converted to a graphical network so in computer science you could think of it as a graphical uh, network and so this is a twitter feed that i got so this is what has happened from just you know making sounds at each other and kind of uh, doing this and when our ancestors did this to right now when we have actually created uh, this whole network of data life is kind of different so now we have indirectly what's called as man machine symbiosis so you do not have to drill an electrode into your brain to basically capture what is going on every stroke on your whatsapp or facebook that you do is a behavioral signature 
that you're actually giving off for free uh, to some company to mine and they can actually target you with ads and change your behavior. And so what you need to know is that life is different right now with all this data. And so anything you do with data, you have to be careful because, uh, you know, people can take the data and use it against or, for, uh, you know, for you. So be very cautious of that. So that is the context in which, uh, you know, uh, I want to kind of present this. So if you look at this, uh, you know, human evolution, we started, like I said, making sounds and symbols and, uh, you know, that became speech and text. And then eventually that became language and art. And so this information sharing experiences and the facts that we have generated is what has helped us become more and more intelligent in the sense that of acquiring knowledge. And so we changed from a nomadic culture to an agricultural civilization. And what that did is that it allowed us to settle on the banks of rivers and then it allowed us to do collective, uh, the, there was collective security was ensured. So it allowed brain growth because uh, specialization and depth of knowledge increased. So in the earlier societies, there were cobblers, blacksmiths, carpenters, all these trades, you know, they were developing and it was normally passed on generation to generation. And so it, it still was contained. And then suddenly the explosion happened. We started writing things down and passing that knowledge across the generation. And so then the breadth and the depth of the knowledge increased. And so that is uh, that is how we kind of made sure that everybody knows stuff. We don't have to repeat and go through all the stuff over and over again. And finally, we come to the scientific method where I want to be very cautious. I gave a similar lecture earlier and somebody said, uh, I said, uh, truth is relative. And my daughter actually uh, uh, listened to this and she said, no, 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 truth is absolute. And actually, I have to be very careful how I define it. Yes, truth. There is an absolute truth. In science, what we are trying to do is we are trying to get closer to that truth by observation and repetition. And, and so there is a there's a scientific method that is still it is disproven. The hypothesis that we put forward is considered the truth. Now, unfortunately, there has been information explosion and there's a lot of conspiracy theories and stuff like that on the Internet. So when you go and see something on the Internet, don't believe that. Don't believe that you have to. You have to verify the authenticity of that. And how do you do that is very difficult. Uh, hopefully, there are some new technologies coming out uh, which might help with that. But for now, trust, trust on the internet is very low. Uh, and the internet was not designed by the US uh, Department of Defense to put in trust because it is normally meant to do defense work where everybody trusted everyone else. When we exploded it to the general public, the trust is gone. So there's a lot of research on trust. How can you increase? the trust in the system. Um, and I'm not going to talk about that for now, but uh, you know, you should you should understand that what we are trying to achieve is to get towards the truth. And another example is uh, Newton's laws where Einstein came and changed it. So eventually Einstein, Einstein kind of modified Newton's law. So we, we tend to kind of still understand how uh, these laws work. And hopefully if some of you are smart, you might go and change that those laws of motion again. But for now, as of as far as we know, Einstein and Newton is what holds with us. So I would like to look at face changes in society and explain that. So the first face change, face change is like ice melting into water. There's a sudden transformation that happens very fast. So the first face change happened during the Industrial Revolution, where physical machines uh, were used to do labor automation. So for example, coal and steam was used to do labor automation. Then came the Information Revolution, where the internet basically became an aggregator of information. It was aggregating all the information. And right now we have always on distributed connect. And so we call cyberspace and the nodes, which are our computers uh, and the network, which is all the networks that we use have scaled even to space. So now we can communicate with outer space also. And so that is the information revolution. Right now, your generation is seeing what's called as the knowledge revolution. So this is where I wanted to tell you all the data that we acquire. We can actually pre-process that data and make sense of that and produce value out of that. And so now we have what is called as cognitive machines that take that data and can do cognitive tasks. And I'll give you a couple of cognitive tasks just to tell you what I mean by that so that the context is again correct. So in the knowledge revolution, let's put the context correct. The human brain is about two pounds. 20% of 100 watts is about 20 watts of power is what our brains consume. So all of us are burning that kind of stuff if you're not sleeping right now, but then uh, the storage is around 2.5 petabytes. Okay, A desktop computer, on the other hand, consumes 200 watts, 10 times the power of what a human brain consumes. And it is 
definitely not as powerful and versatile and, and diverse as the human brain. So there's a long way for us to go. Somebody else has taken over the screen? I think uh, I think I'll have to interrupt. Uh, uh, Joe Thomas. Ajay, Ajay James, please. Did you get my screen back? Can you see now? Yeah. yeah, Ajay. Yeah, I have I have changed it. Okay. So, so are you seeing now the revolution? Yes. Okay. Good. So, so the, the human brain, I put it in context because a lot of people think that the human brain cannot be beaten. And so here are some examples for you. So the first one I want to kind of describe is IBM Deep Blue, the computer IBM Deep Blue bet the chess grandmaster Gary Castro in 1997. And so chess is nothing but a search, a long uh, computer, in computer science terms, it's just a search uh, stuff. So you just search through the thing. If you can search through steps in advance, then actually, uh, you know, pick up the optimal path that you can. So that was solved in 1997. 2015, Professor Lily uh, Fay, you know, in California, she basically created an ImageNet database of all the images of, uh, you know, different objects. And, and they put it out for a competition. And so this is a pattern that you will see now. You know, people put out data sets out and then they ask people to compete on that. And so 2015 is when uh, the computer was able to do object recognition better than a human being. And then in 2017, AlphaGo, which is a much more complex game than chess, uh, Google's uh, AlphaGo machine beat the best Go player on Earth. And so machines are catching up in terms of repetitive uh, behavior, cognitive behaviors. And uh, another example is language translation. There are tools now that can directly, you can talk in English and you can get Arabic at the other end. And so in real time, almost real time. And so these are, these are new stuff that is all happening. And then we'll come to this fake stuff uh, very soon. Automatic, uh, automated stock trading is another one. The machine can read much more information that is put out in a timely fashion. And can oh, uh, I, think, uh, I think Dr. Paul, Ajay yeah. Jain, uh, I think uh, we are not uh, seeing the, your screen. Oh, you're not seeing? Okay, let me let me stop the sharing and then start it again. Yeah. Yes, yes. Um. Sir, I think uh, if you click on that pin, uh, you'll get the presentation by Professor Kula. What is that? Uh, if uh, previously I was seeing your photo only, but later I clicked on that pin. Pin option is there. Uh, there then I could see your presentation also. Your presentation but was most, seen. Most okay. of them uh, after after yeah. the disruption a few minutes ago. Most of them are only seeing. Uh, yeah, now it is yeah, come now back. It's... It has come back now. now it's come. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Now I, I, I re-triggered it. I stopped it and re-triggered it. Yeah. Yeah. So that's okay. That's uh, that's part of that's part of a engineered break. Uh, that's good. So continuing on, you know, I'm I'm trying to give you cognitive examples because a lot of times people think that uh, you know um, th there's a boundary. I mean, uh, machine learning and AI has got a boundary right now, uh, and so these are things that are already happening, so that we kind of understand that. The next one I want to talk about is music and art. And um, recently I read that, uh, you know, uh, there was a machine that actually created a piece of music uh, using old pieces of uh, Bach. Bach is a composer. And, uh, you know, people, experts in the domain could not differentiate that it was made by a machine. So music is already getting there. You can actually pick up, uh, you know, segments of music, the tunes that you like. You can put that together and say, tell the machine, give me something very similar to that. And so that kind of work is going on. Style transfer, so Picasso, the great painter, you know, his style is a very unique style. So if you feed the machine a lot of that style and give it a photograph, it will take the photograph and convert it to the Picasso style. So there's already a lot of computerization and machine uh, AI based, uh, you know, music and art is going. So style, th that particular domain is called style transfer. And then finally, the most, uh, uh, you know, uh, crazy thing that we're seeing right now is autonomous driving. And so in the US now, for example, cars can drive on a highway without any human touching it. Uh, so there are cars that drive so that way. So autonomous driving is there. Here's some examples. And so here's uh, images created by a machine. This is not real human beings. 
This is entirely created by a machine. And what they think is that you can actually replace uh, an actor or an actress with these kind of artificially generated images to your liking. And imagine that you can actually create a movie where you can choose which faces you like, and then the movie will just superimpose the faces back onto the actors that those are just stick figures. So you do not require a very handsome guy uh, to be the, the hero. Uh, you can actually hire me as an actor is what I'm trying to tell you, and then slap a nice face onto it. And so, so that is one. Here's another one. Again, I'm not going to run this. Uh, I will I will share these slides, so please don't take down notes what is already on the slides. I can actually hand over all the slides to Professor Krishna Kumar, and he can actually hand it over to whoever wants it. Uh, so this is, again, a video of Mark Zuckerberg, the Facebook CEO, saying something that he should not be saying, and you can go listen to it uh, you know, if you're interested. And so this is another new problem in the information overload. And so we'll, we'll see what we can do about it. So, Continuing on the thread of evolution of intelligence, the man-machine symbiosis is already on. Whether your brain is being integrated or not, you are actually every type that you do on your smartphone is being recorded and taken and used. And so an example I normally give is that of Uber. Uh, Uber is actually, uh, again, this is again from a business model perspective. I know a lot of you might want to start your own companies. So I do not want you to think of technology just in a smaller bucket, but think of it in the larger scope of things. So Uber is a company that takes information from two different people and make, makes that happen. So if you want to go from point A to point B, and if somebody else is willing to drive you from point A to point B, then Uber just makes you handshake and they take a cut out of that handshake. Now think of it. Uber does not own the car. The car is owned by the poor guy who's driving. They're doing all the dirty work, the capital costs, all the risks, everything is with the driver. Uber is just taking skimming off a thing. Now they have Uber Eats and you have uh, Airbnb and all these kind of models where information technology and data is the new oil. So data is the new oil uh, which is being mined. And so if you are in any domain and you have a lot of data, then you want to rethink how you want to kind of propose your business. Autonomous driving, I again talked about it and I'll tell you something more about it. Uh, what is important about autonomous driving is that if you have a million robotic vehicles on the road, now they will do what is called as distributed error correction. So error correction is one way to kind of close the loop in knowledge. So if you make a mistake, like we talked about the path, and then you know that it's a mistake, then you can correct that error. Error correction is, is considered a sign of intelligence. Now human beings, when I make a mistake, if I drive, I go crash, most of you, I promise you, will not know that I did a stupid mistake because I do not want to tell you that. But machines are different. Machines are controlled by us. So if a car makes a mistake, we take that error and then propagate it by software into every other car. So distributed error correction in a, in a, in a machine is a very, very powerful thing. It can learn very, very fast group uh, errors. And so that is why, to me, autonomous driving is very interesting. But that brings us to ethics, law, and policy. And what does this mean for society? So deep fakes and truth. So there is a lot of wrong information out there uh, on the net. And so how do you deal with it, right? And is it, if somebody does use that information and something happens to them, how do you prosecute that? So the ethics and law is not caught up to technology. Technology is moving at such a rapid pace. And so here's another one called cyber weapons and drones. Uh, is it a better way to kind of run? Is it a better way to kind of run, uh, you know, wars so that less people die? But drones kill un unexpected civilians, right? And so I was on a thesis committee, on a philosophy thesis committee, where they were looking at the ethics of drones and saying that, you know, what rules do you apply? Is it it's, is it fair to use Western civilizational ethical principles? You know, people are questioning uh, what are the ethic principles that you have to kind of use. Uh, what percentage is a cyborg human? So if the human being's organs are being replaced, you can actually use pigs to generate organs. And then if you put those organs in you, after how many organs are you really human? And, you know, these questions are arising. If you have mechanical hands and uh, stuff like that, they're already trying to build artificial hearts, biological artificial hearts using your own stem cells. So you can make a mechanical scaffolding and then put bio, you know, your own stem cells and then create a heart that pulses. So 
people are working on this so if you create a, a new heart then are you fully human and what kind of laws apply to you so these are things that people are thinking about but it's still slow so there is a, there is an opportunity in engineering and law i i guess uh, to think about these kind of stuff so let me let me kind of conclude with this section saying that cognitive automation is given i mean i've kind of shown you enough examples i'm hopefully i'm hoping that you'll be convinced so knowledge is a collective enterprise and so that is what we need to understand now earlier we thought about knowledge collection just from human beings alone but right now it is your phones and sensors and iot is internet of things everything put together is what is this collective thing so we can use knowledge that is not curated by a human being but that is curated by a machine for example and so do not ignore that is what i'm trying to say eventually you get the data pipeline from data to knowledge and and the knowledge is what you need to conceptually understand so that you can actually leverage that so our brains are limited i've shown you that machines have got better uh, in capacity in terms of computational power and in memory even some aspects of creativity that we thought was only human like art and music is being computerized and so this is a dynamic interactive system and so my my suggestion to you uh, is that please try to understand concepts searching on the internet is easy but you need to be able to curate it correctly and then apply that concept to new patterns and new problems and if you can do that then sky is the limit the degree doesn't matter i do not have a computer science degree and i am being i used to be paid by a computer science uh, a computer science company and so all they care is that if they pay you 10 rupees can they make 100 rupees out of you and that is how it works now the better thing is that if you're smart like some of the people in this uh, talk i can see dilip here i'm just calling him out sorry you you run your own company and make other people work for you right so uh, you have that option also so entrepreneurship is another big deal that i like to propagate and and teach so be curious uh, and be in perpetual learning mode and then you will be relevant and you will not be ignored but if you don't do that you know the machine is very likely to take over your stuff so replicate then copy what i mean by that is when you put something on a xerox machine then you get an identical copy we are all replicas of our parents we are biological replicas meaning randomly some portion of your dad and some portion of your mom has been mixed together and it has created you so knowledge is like that you take knowledge from different sources you you mix and match it and then create something new so the biological model of replication is more ideal than the engineering model of copy as far as knowledge is concerned because it's a biological thing that we are trying to kind of push the capture of knowledge so having said that here is a slide from bloomberg that tells you what kind of job so on the x axis here least likely to be automated and here it is most likely to be automated and on the y axis uh the paycheck how 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 much you are getting paid so the best paid least vulnerable occupations are doctors dentists and ceos and so you will see that these are people who interact with people so if you have a high interaction with people in a complex sense then your job is kind of guaranteed but uh, same you know if you have low low education like high school diploma is this orange stuff and you see the the blue is like doctoral and here you know you should you should read it in your own way do not think about it as a phd but think of it as the amount of knowledge in your brain so the more knowledge you have that is useful then you will still be alive and here you can see uh, if you don't have formal education uh, you know like cashiers drivers because of autonomous vehicles food service workers these kind of jobs you can already see in india i've seen dosha machines and all these things happening so low end jobs like that will get automated and then uh, at, high high end jobs like accountants and benefit managers and insurance professionals anything that is rule based meaning that if a machine you can actually plug in the rules into a machine then the machine can execute it those jobs will not exist you know whether we like it or not and so just like in the industrial revolution where a lot of jobs were lost but a lot more were created in the knowledge revolution a lot of jobs will be lost but a lot more will be created so watch out for things that cannot be cognitively automated and those are the jobs that will exist that is the takeaway on that slide and so what are the kind of skills that you need and this is from the world economic forum analytical thinking and innovation active learning learning strategies creativity so these are the kind of things that you require memory do not memorize anything you know kanapadam padiche if you go and actually take your exam great for your exam but you will not 
do well uh, if you do that. So memorization is not what you need to do, even though grades are actually a test of your memory. So I'm sorry to say this, but educational institutions haven't figured out a way to kind of, um, you know, measure what you really, really, really know. And so here's the landscape. And again, this is again from the World Economic Forum. Don't take this uh, too, too much more than what it should. Uh, anything to do with data and, uh, you know, learning from data in any domain is useful. So any domain, including biology, we, we actually work with doctors and stuff like that to take data from them and then create uh, data data based uh, you know systems that actually can reduce the burden of repetitive labor and so that is how you should read this slide and don't uh, you know don't look at it purely from a computer science perspective now those of you who are in computer science might like it but here is the here's the caveat the caveat is that if you don't know the domain knowledge of the particular domain if you don't know biology or medicine then you are still just like the person in biology or medicine who does not know data science so we are trying to educate people across domains at the boundary. And so I run a data science for oceans, ocean scientists and engineers course at Texas a and trying to teach ocean engineers how to do this because for 18, 20 years, this is what I was doing in different other domains. And so that is that section. And so I'll open it up again for the next batch of questions. So thanks, uh, Dr. Paul. Uh, I got a question from uh, Dr. Vinkata Krishnan. Uh, he said of the capacity buildup uh, of ISRO, and this question I feel could be useful to us, or the answer perhaps would be use useful to us for the college and for the future generations. The question is how to train members to see the bigger picture, and how to how to train them systematically. Right. So here, is it over? The question done. How to train the members? to see the bigger picture and right. how to do them do that systematically right so here uh, in the us you know systems engineering is a domain that is being taught here so uh, so th there is actually a course on mit edx which is a paid course obviously but um, boeing and a lot of the big companies aerospace companies have put in a lot of money to educate systems engineers and what i mean by systems engineering is this broader, bigger picture outlook. And so I work for a systems engineering, the research company I work for is a systems engineering company. They do small solutions, but they always look at the bigger picture. And the reason, first let me tell you why it is important. So the human body has got different stuff. You have the heart and the lung and you know all these different organs. Now, if every organ decided to optimize for itself, the human body will fail because all the other organs also have to work. So what we are looking at is a systems optimization of the human body. Maybe, maybe a better engineering and a simpler example is that, uh, you know, I don't know, again, this is a mechanical example, but if you have a pump and a motor, you know, the motor is designed normally uh, independently. There's a lot of motor companies that do motors and there are pump companies. And then when you integrate it together, both the motor and the pump are not at its peak efficiency normally, you know, but when you integrate it, you want the system to be at an optimal level. And so system theory is a very interesting subject where you put all the pieces of the puzzle together and then optimize the total system. Now, Dr. Venkatakrishnan's question is, how do you train people like that? The only way is to kind of educate people in that. And so companies that are in the systems engineering kind of business have inbuilt trainings inside. So ISRO, I'm sure, should send people for systems engineering training, especially those who are at the bigger picture and they see the wider spectrum of what is happening. And then every youngster who comes in, who, who's choosing that path to go up that rather than super specialized. Now, you can be a super specialist and sit in just your domain and then go very, very deep into knowledge. But some people are not satisfied there, then they have to see a little bit of a lot of things. So those are the people that you have to groom for systems uh, engineering. And so, yes, it has to be a conscious educational setup inside every industry of your choosing. And you navigate that path for employees who seem to show the capability to be able to do that. Not everybody is capable to do systems engineering. Some people like their subject so much that they will just like to go deep into that alone. And you should not forcefully take them and train them to be systems engineers. But it's good to get them on the uh, conference calls when you bring together all these different groups. And then that cross discussion is where you actually have that knowledge transfer happening. And that cannot happen at the college level. It happens in the industry where people have what is known as tacit or hidden knowledge more than book knowledge. 
if it is pure book knowledge we could have taught it but there's a lot of tacit knowledge in an industry for a particular domain that is hidden and knowledge based systems where i work for we used to go interview people to understand how they think rather than what they say uh, on on paper because what they say on paper is different than what is inside their brain so you have to ask provoking questions to kind of extract what knowledge they have and earlier long ago before deep learning became a fashion we used to encode that in knowledge databases and that's why the name knowledge knowledge base system so i'm sure that a lot of companies are kind of doing that right now because systems engineering is a more well known well thought out okay. uh, brand uh, uh, all uh, should i uh, can i interrupt there are a lot of yeah. questions uh, in the flow so i think i will cut short uh, the answering duration yeah, okay. a bit okay so the next next, uh, next one is uh, i think from a student who has uh, hiding behind uh, z cubes that's what i see the oh, question that's is my godson that's my godson johan how oh. okay if uh, if ai can time. learn without rest or gaps what is that and if ai artificial intelligence can learn without rest or gaps and humans need gaps and sleep what does this mean to human intelligence versus ai does ai also need sleep or gaps no the machine does not require sleep or gaps so you know you can train the machine it can work 24/7 you don't have to pay it health insurance and all this this is why this is why it becomes so there is a price point uh, very quickly saying a robo that can do burger flipping is uh, you know becomes economical today in us terms at around 15 dollars uh, per hour the 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 wage the lowest uh, the minimum wage for a us worker was around 10 dollars and they were trying to push it to 15 when you push the minimum wage to 15 what happens is that that machine becomes cheap and the problem with the machine or the good thing about the machine is that once you build a machine and show that it works then it learns better and better it keeps correcting its error and so when you mass produce that the per unit cost of that comes down and so the robo will then uh, become 5 dollars per uh, you know it can actually uh, it can become 5 dollars uh, you know uh, it, it can it can bring down the price to a very low point then the human can never compete with it so yes the the machine does not require any rest but the thing is that the per unit cost will keep dropping so be careful of any cognitive task that can be repeated and so i i just saw the question come up from ray kurzweil the, the question is ray kurzweil it's a concept known as singularity so the point at which the point at which the machine becomes more intelligent than the human is called the point of singularity we are nowhere close to that yet people talk about that and yes once that happens then the machine will start learning faster than the human we once that comes we do not know what happens to society as far as i know and as far as i think the research goes no machine has got consciousness yet and so if the machine does not have consciousness it can only do what it is programmed to do so i'll i'll leave that answer there uh, you know so that i can take other questions okay paul i got another question from b anil i think uh, you remember b yeah, anil yeah 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 uh, the question is is it knowledge or knowledge to apply knowledge which is important what is the the ai and human intelligence the comparison no i i didn't understand the question so is it knowledge or is, is it, it knowledge, knowledge or actually? knowledge to apply knowledge which is important yeah apply that is obviously yeah so if you if you understand knowledge well enough then you will know where to apply it if you apply the wrong pattern so let's look at it as a pattern if you apply the wrong pattern to a problem it will not solve the problem or it might give you a suboptimal result so knowing where to apply what is very very important is and it is part of the knowledge actually it is also part of the knowledge so if you have understood knowledge fully then you will know where you can apply it and where you cannot so an example is newton's law there are certain places where it can apply and there are certain places where it will fail if you go close to the speed of light it will fail so no, having knowledge of that is important okay uh Paul, there is another question from uh, Vishnu Suresh. He is a final year student at the college. Uh, his concern is, sir, we usually have big ideas that we hope will impact the society as a whole and give back to the community. But soon, a feeling of helplessness engulfs us, and the initial power 
we usually have will settle down to easy and ordinary project what's your advice to help us regain the confidence yeah very 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 good valid question so here is a thing let's say that uh, you know i want to climb mount everest i am not just going to fly to kathmandu and then straight away climb mount everest if you do that you will fail you will die maybe so when you have a dream you have to break up that dream into small bite sized chunks and then execute each of them in in serial fashion and then you will have error correction and you will slowly eventually reach there you cannot you know you should actually dream big you should dream to get under the top of mount everest or something like that but you have to learn how to bite size it it's called bite size chunk it down into smaller segments and then learn to execute that and get help you cannot do great things by yourself alone if you are not part of a team you are not going to achieve anything great in life so anything that i have done and i've shown you has not happened and you can ask anybody who has like you ask isro isro and any of these folks nobody can do everything on their own you have to have a large team so you have to then have what is called dreamers like you along with you so lot of people will say no that is not possible and when they say that you do not fight with them you move away and go and find other like minded people who believe in your dream you keep increasing the number of people in the dream and then eventually you divide up the work and then you conquer that is my suggestion and so i'm actually doing a course on dreamer uh, and how to kind of achieve your dream when the dream is too big and one of the key things they said is surround yourself with like minded dreaming people uh, but you should also surround yourself with people more intelligent than you then you will achieve what you need to achieve and so if you are the brightest person in the room then there is you are restricted by your own knowledge so you typically want to build a team with different skills diverse skills people with more knowledge than you then you will achieve your goal faster uh, i think paul there is a related question from z cubes mm -hmm. uh, do sleep dreams etc assist in learning itself i think you have already answered that question uh, they are talking about the biological thing yes it is known uh, we can take that offline but the biological brain is known to kind of revisit stuff and yes the, in the rem cycle and uh, you know i think it's not in the rem cycle but before the rem cycle uh, the dreams are replayed uh, the no, actually in the rem cycle the dreams are replayed very deeply and so when you when you are revisiting a lot of the dreams are actually simulations that your brain is doing so even though your body is almost frozen most of your muscle activity comes down i don't want to go into neuroscience but uh, you know you can read about this in brain technology your muscles will kind of relax and your brain will be still actively working in the rem cycle stage and so yes you are actually simulating a lot of scenarios so if you have if you have had dreams like peri sapnam where you have fallen off a cliff that is your brain simulating things that you do not have to do physically so that you will not jump off a cliff and so those are there is a lot of studies on that yes yeah i think paul uh, i'll have one more question for this session because yeah. we are uh, overrunning the time is by from uh, dilip radha krishnan dilip is from the industry dilip is my batch mate from 83 batch electrical his question is we are into engineering solutions of uniquely engineered products so getting engineering solutions from outside the box is very important during our routine work how close are we to this kind of problem solving in the industry so in the us again i'm going to use the example that i know which is the company i work for uh, we hired we hired mathematicians we hired philosophers actually we have philosophers in in the company who actually helped us do language design and so initially when i joined the company from an indian background i thought crazy guys why are they hiring these philosophers and wasting money but eventually you will realize that they they contribute a different systems level view to the whole thing so philosophers just think they do not provide any solution so actually it's a pain to work with them because they cause more problems for you in terms of poking holes at everything that you do but eventually i have learned to accept being criticized once you're married then most of us will know that you know criticism is part of life 
and then you you learn to accept it and once you learn to accept that life is actually not bad actually because there is some value in being criticized and these philosophers help you do that so if you want to kind of get that kind of environment hire people who are not of your kind who you think are related and will contribute so there are not all philosophers can do that so some philosophers deal with technology philosophy of technology kind of stuff they are very good because they can poke holes at different things so one of the things we do with ethics is that in ethics we have philosophers actually i taught the engineering ethics course with the philosophy department and so it just opens up your mind like crazy i because of that i got onto the drone committee for the phd thesis so it is always good so i also want to say biology so one of the things i'm very excited about is can you use biology the concepts from biology and integrate it to engineering and so now i'm working with the marine biology professor to create a huge structure that can self grow itself i don't know whether it is going to happen in my lifetime but at least we are working on that but you have to collaborate across disciplines not just engineering a multidisciplinary engineering is known but going across outside engineering is very very valuable if if you think that that particular domain has a fusion possibility you have to make a call on that and it is expensive initially you will see the results very much downstream okay paul uh, then i think uh, we'll move on to the next session and we'll oh, okay. uh, continue with these this questions which are remaining after the next session okay the next session is very small so given what we know and it's very good i i kind of appreciate all the questions that came in but because you see that when you ask questions is when we learn so when when you get a lecture from a professor you listen to that it is nice you might absorb it but when you use it is when when it kind of sticks it's like it's like your physical muscles you know uh, so when you exercise your muscles become stronger and stronger and so you could think of it as if you take a concept and try to think about it differently than what your professor has been telling you or whoever has been telling you then it makes your brain muscles in a sense stronger or the neuronal firing of your brains become more stronger and embedded such that the synapses will then kind of lock in and that is how memory is retained but anyway so uh, you want to kind of ask questions so given what we know the education model so far that we know is called the conveyor belt model k through 12 in the us means kindergarten through grade 12 you are just putting students all into this conveyor belt and throwing them from first grade to second grade to 10th grade to 12th grade and then suddenly parents tell them hey you know go for engineering or medicine and then they do something that their parents want to do and not what they want to do that is a very very bad model why because human beings are not cars we are actually different everybody wants to choose a different path even from k through 12 our path is different and so because our path is different we have to learn to uh, you know have customized models of education and that is what uh, we are trying now desperately and so we we have seen massively open online courses which are the moocs which is continuous lifelong learning and i have told you that do not be satisfied with degrees that you get you need to kind of uh, do more than that so khan academy uh, for k through 12 Coursera, MIT, EDX are uh, you know uh, two of the online platforms, and Udacity now has what is called as nano degrees. Google and people like that are hiring those who get good uh, you know certificates from Udacity. So the business model of the university sector is kind of you know changing, and I might lose my job very soon. So you know large big universities uh, you know are not in fashion right now. So. but i want to warn you there's a difference between certain kinds of knowledge and so there is this thing called active or experiential learning now to ride a bicycle or to swim or to do scuba these are skills that you cannot learn by theory i can lecture all day long how to bike but if you don't sit on a bike and you don't fall you are not going to learn how to bike and so experiential learning is also important now online content is good for you know things that do not require experiential learning and so we have come about with this model called inverted model we meaning that the educational sector and so what we are trying to do is we are trying to bite size uh, videos bring it small make it like 15 minutes or so that is why ted talks are very small and then what we want to do is that you want to work out the tough problems in the class so instead of sending a bunch of homework back home 
you want to come into the class and do all these difficult problems and when you are stuck you have a professor there to immediately clarify your doubt recalibrate your mental model and hopefully send you on the right path okay so the tough problem should be done at, in the class and then then once you are thorough with that then you can go back and do your easier things at home so instructor one on one support in class and then we encourage what is called as peer learning that is if you know something and if you tell somebody else about it then your knowledge increases and so this is a dirty secret in the education sector which i'm going to spill out here is that most of us professors we learn when students ask us questions and if you ask me a question and i normally have a game with my students called stump the professor if a student can ask me a question that i cannot answer then i am forced to go and read about it learn about it and then come back but think about the beauty of it i am getting paid to increase my own knowledge so knowledge is one thing that is always increasing no matter how much you give away of it unlike material stuff like money you give it off it goes it's a zero sum kind of stuff you have to look at it but knowledge is something that you give off the more you give off the more you know in a sense and so so you know this is a good thing so if you are interested in getting into teaching you will learn at somebody else's expense is what i'm trying to tell you so that is just a plug for those of you who would like to get into teaching and so here is a typical classroom that we have and so the pro the students don't look at the professor so unlike the indian education system where uh, you know obedience and uh, silence and all this is like valued at a very high level uh, what i want to say is that students uh, my students actually sit around a desk and they try to solve their own problems and the professor sits there we typically give a 10 15 15 minute lecture and all of them have their own computer so they can see us on their computers if they need to or they can just turn around and look and see us on on lecturing and then the professor walks in between the students and then helps them in groups so we tackle them in groups hopefully to give them a more custom education so we are trying to move away from a mass produced education model to a more individual custom education now if you have 60 students it is difficult so i have other uh, people i have post doctors who are along with me who i am in training who i train them to kind of explain how things are and so when they get stuck they call me and then we kind of explain it and so it's a group effort of how uh, this whole uh, active learning classroom is right now so what are the big things that you need to know uh, 21st century report card collaboration i said teamwork is very important communication you should know how to speak read write and all that stuff and most importantly you need to know how to listen and again i'm i'm going to reference my wife who told me not to reference her during my lectures and so she's been telling me listen to others listen to others and so listening is a very important skill in communication content is plenty internet information age we are drowning in information but we are starved for wisdom and what that means is that there's a lot of information but converting it into wisdom is really understanding it and being able to apply it and so somebody asks the question of how do you apply something is very important now for that you need critical thinking so what we should actually be teaching students is how to critically think through a problem um and then be very innovative and then you should have the confidence to take safe risks some student asks you know how do i do this so safe risk means that don't do uh, walk up the mount everest without any training you want to bite size it and take smaller steps and then slowly get to your goal especially if the goal is very large bite size it and then take those risks and so this is from this article here and so in conclusion uh, machines are getting smarter whether we like it or not repetitive cognitive tasks will be outsourced there's nothing that the government can do to help you so be careful about that understand the concept if you have knowledge then you will have job security if you get good grades you will get your first placement and be very very cautious of that so grades if you cheat and get good grades you might get your first placement but very soon in the industry they'll realize you don't know much and they'll throw you off or you have to can recalibrate and learn yourself so understand the difference between the two those who have high grades can have high knowledge right but typically grade is not an indicator of your future success so you know don't worry if your grades are not that great test taking is a skill uh, and i should not be talking about this in a university segment but i thought it is better to be truthful up front so that all of us understand what the game is the content is distributed so learn to apply uh, search and then apply the knowledge and here is something that engineering education in the us uh, we are doing is uh, we call it the three a's of engineering the first one is called abstraction so if you learn a concept then you should understand the abstract notion of what it means 
so that you can generalize it and apply it over and over and over again. Now, if you can do that, then you can write an algorithm for that abstraction. And that is the algorithmic thinking portion of engineering that we teach. And if you do that, then most engineering students have to learn some programming language, which will enable them to automate the algorithm that you just abstracted. So that is the three pillars of uh, engineering education in the US. And so innovate. And so don't just blindly copy. If you are copying something, if your job entails doing the same thing over and over and over again, I promise you a machine will take you over. So you do not do not be in the business. Actually, you should write a program to do that job and go lie on the beach and have fun. If your employer is willing to pay you for just doing mundane repetitive tasks, do it, finish it with the program, and then go take your time off or go learn, actually. So continuous learning is, 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 is the standard. That is what you have to do. Look at the path. There is no ideal path for everybody. It's a different thing, depending on the circumstances that you come into. So choose the path. And if you make a mistake, don't worry. You can correct it in the next step. And so look for opportunities. So look for opportunities, which is on your dream path. So look for things that you can do. So for me, I was very interested in ocean energy, even though I was a mechanical engineer. So I chose to go to IIT because the professor told me that if you help design this thing, we'll, we'll help you build it. And so that was more exciting to me than something else, my alternative. So I chose that particular path. And here's something that we teach uh, our students is be socially relevant. And I think the younger generation, they have been trained and tuned to that. And so I'm very proud of the next generation being very socially relevant and try to have global impact. And so Texas A&M, again, uh, we actually, uh, you know, force uh, most of our students to go outside the country. And I actually brought a bunch of students to Goa, Bits Pilani, Goa to do this ethics, engineering ethics course. And so we have the largest global student program uh, of uh, you know, the, the public universities in the US actually right now. And so it's a very big push. We're trying to teach them to be more global and stuff like that. And so dream big and go change the world. So that is my uh, big preach to you. And uh, we'll open it up for discussions. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Paul. Uh so I got a, a question from Hari Shankar. Mm -hmm. This question has been uh, in the field for uh, from time immemorial. What he asks us: Should we dive dive deep or go wide during learning? I would say I would say both. Uh, so when I was doing my PhD, I was going deep, and then once I did my PhD, I started going wide. And so different phases in your life, it is different. Certain problems, you have to go in deep. Uh, so if you can find like-minded people that can help your vision or your dream, then you can go broad and then collect the people and get them all together. If there is a particular problem that you're not getting anybody to solve, then I would suggest that you go deep, otherwise your problem will not be solved because you, you have to solve it yourself in a sense. So, you choose whether you go deep or wide, depending on the circumstances and what your path or the position in your path is. I'm keeping the answer short so that I can okay, get more. Okay, clear. yeah, so we have to, we have to. Uh, I got another another interesting question from, I think it's from uh, Professor Manoj. The question is, if art, music and design, which symbolize creativity, are being taken over by machines and AI, where would the man's brain end up? Okay, good, good question. Uh, it, it's, it's rightfully, you have to be a little worried uh, if the machine is capable. So we have to understand what creativity means. I'll give you an example in terms of chess. So when Gary Caspro was defeated by IBM Blue Jean, uh, you know, then one option is we could have thrown up our hands and said, okay, we're done. Chess is gone, we can't do anything. But that is not what has happened. So right now we have what is called as hybrid education and hybrid education, sorry, hybrid, what am I saying? Hybrid chess playing. That is you have machines uh, and grandmasters working together. So now the competition is grandmasters and machines together playing another grandmaster and a machine. So there are certain aspects of the human which are kind of key and there are certain aspects of machine is very good at searching through large search spaces. So you can actually play with that game. And so uh, when, when that Go, AlphaGo was being done, uh, you know, when the machine was learning the tricks which, uh, you know, other players were playing, if you come up with a new strategy that is not available for the machine, you can actually beat the machine in a, in a, in a sense. But as soon as the machine gets the data, then it will beat you. 
So the human is considered to be more creative. Now let me bring it back to art and music. So art and music, think about the machine as a tool. See, so earlier we had instruments to play something that you thought about in your brain. Now think about the machine as something that can take all the patterns that you already created and give you an alternate pattern that could be a nice new piece of music. Now, you can actually see through that and uh, do an integrated machine, man machine. That's why I, I didn't go into deep about this, but man machine symbiosis is here to stay. So don't treat the machine as your enemy, but treat it as your friend. And the combination of you will do much better. Now, if machines get consciousness, that is a different story. So that we have not reached yet. If machines become conscious and then they decide that we are not required as a species, that is fiction right now. That is science fiction right now. We are not there yet. But that for that, you have to go read about what consciousness means. And again, this is how you become curious. And so this is what I do in my spare time because my kids are grown and gone. So that's what we do. But go read about it and then you will see more stuff and we can take it offline if you need to. There is one more question from him. It's very relevant nowadays. Because of the information explosion, concentrating on a specific segment of knowledge is becoming a big problem. There should be a propaganda on how to stay off from information pollution. Yeah, so people are working on it. Unfortunately, the uh, architecture of the internet did not have uh, trust built into the system. People are working on research to build trust into the system. I don't know if you heard about this last week. The Department of Energy in the US actually announced a quantum encrypted internet, which will you will not get access to it for a long time to come. But the quantum internet uh, will have guaranteed uh, authentication built in using quantum principles. And so the defense will first get it just like DARPA, ARPA had the internet and then eventually it will come out. So what they will might do it is they will use that for financial trade uh, and, and stuff like that. Things and healthcare where uh, the truthfulness of data is very important and corruption is not allowed. And so first the quantum internet will be on those sectors and then eventually it will propagate out. We have to phase out the current internet in some way, but I don't think it, it will happen uh, very soon. Uh, you know, it could, but it, I don't think knowing what I know today, it will happen because the quantum internet is an expensive proposition which runs uh, on, on, you know, technologies which, which are very difficult to scale right now. We do not know how to scale it. Let me just leave it there. So yes, trust is going, people are working on this. And so everybody interested in working on trust and who knows, you might create the next trust Google maybe, you know, if you come up with a scheme to do that. Okay, Paul, I think uh, we'll close the discussions with the last question is from your classmate Wilson. Wilson is from Bahrain. I think uh, they organized a similar session uh, in, in Bahrain uh, a, few, a couple of weeks back. Uh, it's about uh, a definition for uh, two things, a robotic process automation and a digital workforce. Can you give a short description? Yeah. So. You know, I, I'm not an expert uh, in that, but I'll, I'll, I'll take a stab at it. So robotic process automation is like on a conveyor belt and stuff like that. You know, there are companies working on reducing the number of human interventions in that process. So a good example is uh, one of the new robots. I forget the name of the robot, but uh, Baxter. Baxter, there's a company, uh, there's a robot that actually can see a human being pick stuff on a conveyor belt and learn what the human being is doing and then eventually eliminate the human being. And so you do not have to program a thing right now. So robotic process automation is if you have any process, now this is a physical process, but it does not have to be a physical process. For example, document routing. Actually, my wife actually works in document routing uh, logic, which, is, which, which says that you know, if you have uh, you know, uh, file pushing, you don't need a human being to kind of do that. I mean, you can actually set up permissions and stuff like that where the, 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 the process that you are in actually goes to the next person. And when that person verifies, it goes to the next person. And there's already software templates and back, backing that can actually do that. So you can look at process automation. I am looking at it from an industrial engineering perspective because that is the background that I have uh, with the company I worked. And so we used to help both physical processes as well as cognitive processes. And actually just a plug for the company I work for, they are the inventors of the uh, process model standards for the 
uh, Air Force, Department of Air Force in the US long time back. And so process modeling is a standardized um, uh, you know, technology that has been implemented and there's an Air Force standard on that called IDEF or Integrated Definition Methodology. Yeah, I think uh, we'll conclude for the day. There are a few more questions, but I think uh, we'll be having a forum, a continuous forum under the Alumni Association where the students, the faculty and the alumni can interact and exchange ideas. And for the time being, I'll send uh, all these comments and questions to you, Paul, and okay. you can answer them and give back uh, uh, so that we can spread it to the community. And okay. once uh, I, I would like to say that behind every successful man, there will be a lady. And in the case of Paul, we are very happy that the lady is also from GEC. I also congratulate uh, Binu, Binu Paul. He's not seen in the picture, but still, we acknowledge her presence for having given motivation to Paul. So next, uh, I think I'll invite uh, Dr. Vijay Kumar to present a, a digital certificate to Dr. Paul. Yeah. Good evening, Dr. Paul. Okay. Thanks to Professor Kishova, Dr. Shiba, and Dr. Noshaja for giving an opportunity to listen to you through this lecture series. You have presented very well. That is one of the most simplest way. That is what is education, how our young graduates should move forward to achieve their objective. So they have given an opportunity assign the responsibility to me, to me to present the certificate. So let me read the content of the certificates with the permission of the, all the people who are involved listening to you. So let me read. Certificate of Appreciation presented to Dr. Paul Maria Kola, Professor of Practice, Texas A&M AM University for delivering a lecture on education and job security in the age of cognitive machines in the Art Ingenium online lecture series, jointly organized by Innovation and Entrepreneurship Development Center, GECT, and GECT Development Trust on 4th August 2020. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. Dr. Vijay yeah, Kumar, I think yeah. uh, I invite Sri Lakshmi to present the word of thanks. Sri Lakshmi. Okay. Uh, so, good evening, everyone. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, we've all had an excellent, we've listened to an excellent lecture on education and job security in the age of cognitive machines by Paul, sir. Uh, the session was indeed useful for all of us, and I would love to thank Paul, sir, for sparing his time for us GECNs and for presenting such an amazing lecture. Thank you very much, sir. I take this opportunity to thank GCT Alumni Association, GCT Development Trust, and IDC GCT for joining hands to provide us with such a great opportunity. I would also like to thank our alumni, staff, and the students who took part in this lecture and made this venture a great success. Thank you all. Okay. So I hope uh, it was a wonderful session. So this is... Uh, closing of the session and I'm very happy to announce that we'll be continuing with uh